from heaven above with the wind. Some power and the love our God is an awesome God. Yes, he is. Providence, you should know that standing boldly and proudly awesome and elegantly with President Biden on her right, Vice President Harris on her left, with our newly confirmed Supreme Court Justice. Amen. Love our God Amen. Is an awesome God. Amen. Amen. start the slideshow. Our newly confirmed Supreme Court Justice, Katanji Brown Jackson, stated these words. It has taken 232 years. It's taken 115 prior appointments for a black woman to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. But we've made it. Justice Jackson represents the beauty of our blackness. She demonstrated strength, resolve, joy, warmth, faith, and perseverance without allowing a single person to turn her around. When she offered a tearful tribute to her daughters, she stated, in my family, it took just one generation to go from segregation to the Supreme Court of the United States. God is an awesome God. Providence, with all that is going wrong with our world, sometimes it is great to come to church on a Sunday morning. Amen. It's great to see the gloomy clouds part and to see God smile down upon us because our God is an awesome God. For every one of you in here, you should know that Justice Jackson is uniquely qualified, not simply because she has an amazing list of qualifications, not simply because her qualifications on paper exceed every other justice on the Supreme Court right now. No, she is uniquely qualified simply because she is a black woman. A black woman who can remind all of our daughters and all of our sons the message that our ancestors have tried to instill within us. There is nothing that your eyes can see that you cannot achieve. It was Maya Angelou it was Maya Angelou who stated, I have learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. Justice Jackson, on this day, you have made us as a people feel exceedingly proud, exceedingly strong, and exceedingly joyful. And this day, on this Palm Sunday, this is the day that we praise God. And Justice Daxton, you should know that every day, the members of Providence Missionary Baptist Church will pray that God will bless your leadership on the highest court in the land. Let us pray. Our God indeed is an awesome God. God, you reign from heaven and earth. God, we are just thankful that, that, Lord, you sat with that amazing woman and allowed her to be protected from insult, to be protected from foolishness, to be protected from questions that had nothing to do with her coming on to the Supreme Court. And with dignity and grace, she persevered and will assume her seat 
that you ordained for her life before the creation of the world. Lord, bless Justice Jackson. Bless the entire Supreme Court to make decisions, Lord, that are in alignment with your will, that are in alignment with good common sense, and that are in alignment with the best interests of the citizens of this nation. God, allow something that happened this past week with her confirmation to light a fire within each and every one of us, particularly as African Americans, that we might remember that God is still in the blessing business. And that no matter how it might look that evil is winning, that Lord, the answer is not in doubt, that we can trust you at all times and in every way. And now, great God, on this Palm Sunday, a Sunday of both celebration and lament, let us, Heavenly Father, move forward into the preached word, letting you be the preacher. God, speak to me and through me. This morning, Lord, allow your people to be edified. Allow your righteous name to be glorified. God, we ask it all in the name of Jesus, I do pray. And all of God's children said together, amen, amen, amen. Happy Palm Sunday, Providence Missionary Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. Friends, you should know Palm Sunday is a very weird Sunday in the liturgical season of the Christian. When you read the Bible, it would appear that Palm Sunday would appear to be a celebratory Sunday. It is the Sunday upon which Jesus triumphantly re-entered Jerusalem, preparing for the final week of his earthly ministry. It's the Sunday when people pulled branches, palm branches, off of trees and, and waved them in the air, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then less than a week later, those very same people were saying, crucify him and kill him. Palm Sunday, like Good Friday, should be a day of not only celebration, but lament. Palm Sunday is a day that you and I are reminded of the fickleness of human nature. That human beings can be with you one moment and against you the next. That human beings can be talking good about you in one breath and talking bad about you in the next. That human beings can be in full support of you on Monday and ready to get rid of you by Tuesday. Palm Sunday is the day that we remember that human beings are sinners. And if Jesus could deal with people saying Hosanna, Hosanna to him on Sunday, all the while knowing that by Friday they'd be ready to crucify him. And Jesus would still get up on the cross and die for those very same people. Palm Sunday should remind you to let the fickle people in your life off the hook as well. Rather than remembering people's wrongdoings, rather than remembering how they were with you one moment and against you the next, rather than holding against them how they didn't support you here, but they did support you there. Palm Sunday is your reminder that Jesus understood that humans are sinners and they can't be trusted. But that God loved them so much that God in his pinnacle work of creation created the human, and that if God loves the human, you and I have been called to do the same as well. So on Palm Sunday, as we enter into this message, I know there are people who were with you yesterday and ain't with you today. People that were supporting you last week and aren't supporting you today. Those are the very people that this day, Palm Sunday, calls you to let off the hook. Palm Sunday is the day that you are reminded that the nature of our faith is to forgive the fickle nature of the human because humans being fickle is as common as breathing in and out. And the reason why you can forgive the fickle nature of others is because Palm Sunday reminds us that it was you and I who pulled the branches off the trees and were saying, Hosanna. You see, if you look back over your life, there were times when you and I were in full support of Jesus. We were there as he triumphantly entered Jerusalem. And there are times when you and I have been angry with Jesus. We were mad that Jesus didn't do something that we wanted. And so we were there saying, crucify him, crucify him. You and I have been fickle with Christ. 
And so before we dare hold up someone else for being fickle with us, let us look in a mirror. And in looking in that mirror, let us forgive others, just as Jesus Christ has forgiven us. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I would take you to the thesis verse of today's message on the 23rd chapter of Luke. The thesis verse of today's message in the 23rd chapter of the book of Luke. I'm going to change the thesis verse so, Asia, you don't have to put it on the screen. I'm changing my mind. Let's look at the 22nd verse. Luke chapter 23. Look at the 22nd verse. Pontius Pilate is speaking here. He says these words, underline them in your Bible. Luke chapter 23, verse 22. Here's what it says. A third time he said to them, why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no grounds for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. Underline these words. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. Brothers and sisters, with the help of your prayers and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we want to preach to you this morning on the subject of what if Jesus was betrayed but never crucified? What if Jesus was betrayed but never crucified? Providence family and our guests who are streaming with us online, you should know that we began this month of April under a new series entitled Rethinking the Passion of Jesus Christ. And many of us are familiar with the term, the passion of Jesus Christ. As last week I told you, it is a term given to talk to us about the storied arrest, trial, and crucifixion of Jesus. If you just hit that button right there, it'll turn off. Just hit that center button. Recall that the word passion actually comes from the Latin verb patior, which in its original meaning in Latin is a word that means suffering, to suffer and to endure. This month, my plan is to walk you through the final week of Jesus' life, the final days of suffering, his final passion. And, and we're going to explore what would happen to our Christian theology if the week happened differently. My goal by the end of the week is for you to understand foundationally that our resurrection Christology, our, our understanding of Jesus, the way that we understand Jesus, is specifically built on this last week happening exactly as it did. And actually, if any one element of the week ends, the entire theology falls apart. Last week, we explored, well, what would happen if Jesus was never betrayed? And this week, we will explore what happens if he's betrayed, but not crucified. Uh, the question has both practical and theological significance for us as Christians. To explore the theological significance of what happens if Jesus is betrayed and not crucified, the, the best way I could explain it to you is for you to think about the ozone layer. D do you remember in science class when they taught you about the ozone layer and how the sun burns? They taught you that the sun is this great, beautiful, radiant star way up in the sky. And it is so strong and it is so powerful that in science class, the teacher tried to teach you that that star provides light and warmth to this earth and to the entire solar system day in and day out. But if you stayed awake in science class, I didn't because my science teacher was boring. But if you stayed awake, you would have heard the teacher remind you that the sun does not burn like a campfire burns. Campfires burn, and they're based upon this thing called oxygen. Oxygen feeds the fire. It makes the fire grow. If you take the oxygen out of the fire, the fire dies down. It's good news that the sun does not burn like the campfire burns, because if it did, the oxygen would come out of the sun over time, and the sun would burn out, and we would all die. That process is called chemical combustion. For details not relevant to the sermon, you should know the sun doesn't burn by chemical combustion. The sun actually burns by something called nuclear fusion. 
And in this nuclear fusion process, one of the negative outcomes of nuclear fusion is the emitting of ultraviolet radiation. It's not something you can see with your eyes. It's not something that's visible like ultraviolet light. But it is something far stronger, something far more dangerous. You know, too much exposure to ultraviolet radiation or UV rays can cause skin problems and eye problems. And it's been linked to all manner of cancer. Uh, the reason we have all not succumbed to the effects of the ultraviolet radiation that the sun is beaming down at the earth each and every day has nothing to do with how much sunscreen that you have on. It has nothing to do with the fact that you sit inside and the sun can't get to you. But it has everything to do with this thing God provided called the ozone layer. Think of the ozone layer as a protective ring that is wrapped around the earth. And what the ozone layer does is it traps ultraviolet radiation when it hits it, and it shields the earth from the full measure of UV rays getting to the earth. The ozone layer, brothers and sisters, quite literally steps up on our behalf, and it does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. This, brothers and sisters, is the theological significance of the crucifixion. Jesus' death on the cross, the, the blood that he shed, is the metaphorical ozone layer for humanity. Jesus' blood places a protective ring around us and it covers us from the judgment of God and the penalty of sin as it comes down to the earth from heaven. Jesus' crucifixion steps up for us just like the ozone layer, and it does for us on our behalf what we could never do for ourselves. But what if Jesus was never crucified? What happens if that ozone layer of protection is not there? Betrayed by Judas, arrested by the chief priest. But what if Pontius Pilate sticks to his gun? And finds Jesus not guilty and actually, like the 22nd verse says, releases him. A just and right result it would be. The man was not guilty. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't deserve to be beaten, let alone flogged, as Pontius Pilate articulates. It would have been just and right to have let Jesus go. And if Jesus would have lived, humanity would have never had our ozone layer. Here's how we got to this point. If you read Luke's version of the story, you would remember that Jesus is arrested by the chief priests, their slaves, and the officers of the temple police and their elders. Uh, they arrested him as the moral authorities of the community. But at the moment Jesus was arrested, you have to realize in the Bible, he wasn't really arrested. He was just kind of arrested. The Jews arresting Jesus in the garden would be no different than me arresting you outside your house. I, I could arrest you because I could detain you if I brought enough people, but I actually don't have the authority to arrest you. Jesus being arrested was kind of like a citizen's arrest. And to make the arrest official, what the Jews had to do was they had to turn Jesus over to Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of the Roman province of Judea. While they were the moral authorities who could morally arrest Jesus, Pontius Pilate was the legal authority from Rome. He was the only one who could decide matters of life and death for citizens in a Roman province. Jesus was brought before Pilate by the moral authorities. He was brought before him to be tried and convicted. And if you read the Bible closely, there are two accusations, two Roman legal accusations that are made against Jesus. The first was that he was guilty of subverting the Jewish nation. We are an independent nation of Jews. We have our own religious order. We have our own things that we follow. And what Jesus is doing is he's coming to our people who are in our independent system, who are following our legal and religious laws, and he's telling people they're no longer valid. He's telling people they no longer have to do the things that our Bible claims that it says that it does. And we have agreed to follow our priests and our ecumenical structure. And Jesus is throwing it out the window. He's subverting the Jewish nation. Well, Rome really wouldn't care about that. So, so they brought a second accusation against him. The second um, um, ooh, I can't talk. The second accusation was that he was subverting 
Roman rule. You see, here he is telling the people they don't have to go through the priest. And if they don't have to go through the priest, then they can go directly to God for themselves. But what you and I have to understand about how things worked in antiquity, it was actually the priest who they brought their money to, and the priest directed them to give their money to the tax collector. The money goes to the tax collector, and the tax collector takes that money and gives it to the emperor. So, hey, Rome, you may not be upset that Jesus is messing with the Jews, but you might be upset that if he's messing with us, he's messing with your taxes. And if he's messing with your taxes, then the emperor's not going to get his money. Now, the emperor was the president. Pilate was like the governor, like you have Joe Biden and Brian Kemp. And so what happens when Pilate finds out that his boss will no longer be getting the money he's supposed to get? It was not his job, Pilate, to care about the law. It was not Pilate's job to care about right or wrong. Pilate's job as the governor of Judea was to keep the peace and make sure the citizens paid their taxes to the emperor. The Roman, the Roman emperor Tiberius at the time was, had a big deal on getting his money. Pilate has all manner of citizens in the province of Judea. When you go home tonight, Google how large the province of Judea was. Pilate didn't just have to concern himself with a band of believers called the Jews. He didn't just have to concern himself with a band of believers called the Christians. Pilate had hundreds of thousands of citizens who worshipped different religions, who were part of different moral orders, who did different things. His responsibility was to keep all these different people with their different religions and their different understandings understanding, keep them peaceful and paying taxes to the emperor. This little insurrection amongst a few Jews and some new Christians was actually small potatoes in the grand scheme of things that Pontius Pilate had to deal with. So you'll notice that's why when you read the Bible, Pontius Pilate didn't just want to kill an innocent man, but he also didn't want to disturb the peace. So the Bible actually says that to try to not have to deal with the issue, he punted the issue to Herod Antipas, who was the ruler of Galilee, when he learned that Jesus was a Galilean. Now let's put this into context. Judea would have been like the state of Georgia. So Pilate, would, who was the governor of Judea, would have been like the governor of Georgia. He would have been like Brian Kemp. Well, Herod was the king of Galilee, and the king of Galilee, Galilee was a city within the province of Judea. So that's like Atlanta being a city within the state of Georgia. So what Pontius Pilate is to Brian Kemp is what Herod is to Mayor Andre Dickens. Herod Antipas would have been the Andre Dickens. He would have been somebody who grew up in Galilee, who was friends with all the other Galileans. It was like what Pilate was doing was saying to Jesus, you went to Mays High School, Mayor Dickens went to Mays High School, y'all about the same age, y'all all know each other. Go back to Galilee and deal with this among your own people. Pilate was thinking, if I send Jesus back to Galilee, then all the Galilean people will know what's going on. They'll handle the issue. They'll deal with him. The peace will stay and the money will keep flowing to the emperor. Verse 11 of Luke 23 says, even Herod with his soldiers treated Jesus with contempt. They, they mocked him. Then they put an elegant robe on him and they sent him back to Pilate. Uh, so, Pilate, you're not going to get away with, with sending this problem on to Galilee. You're not going to force me to make a decision. And so, when Jesus comes back, Pilate seemingly makes the right decision. Verse 13 of the text says, Pilate calls together the chief priests, the leaders, and all the people. And he said to them, listen, you brought me this man and told me that he was perverting the people. And, and I've examined him in your presence. I have not found him guilty, and I can't find any charges to bring against him. I then sent this same man down to Herod, and Herod sent him back to me. He's done nothing. I'm in verse 15. He's done nothing to deserve death. I'm going to flog him and have him released. He's done nothing to deserve death. I'm going to have him released. But I know you're upset. So to keep the peace, to not make him and his people happy, I'm going to release him. And to not make you and your people unhappy, I'm going to flog him. He tries to play both sides of the coin. But Pilate says, I will release him. Can you imagine what God was doing in heaven when Pilate said, I was release him? It's kind of like when you're at home watching the Falcons right there on the two-yard line and they still don't score. He's, God is just yelling, down, what are you doing, Pilate? I need him crucified. What do you mean you're going to release him? 
Brothers and sisters, this is where the theological significance of the crucifixion story hits us right in the face. If the story ended here at verse 22, and Jesus is not crucified, do you realize that the sin debt that you and I owe would have never been paid? Theologians call this, jot this down in your notes, this is called substitutionary atonement. It is the, theolo the theology of, of substitution. It is the idea in our Western theological understanding that God gave humanity choice when we were created. And if one man could choose to enter sin into the world, that man named Adam, then one man could choose to step up and die for the penalty of sins for the world, that man named Jesus. If Jesus is not crucified, the theology of substitution falls apart. There is no longer Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, because he wouldn't have paid it all. And if Pilate doesn't change his mind and crucify Jesus, the bill would still be due. The difference is you and I would be paying it. Could you imagine what life would be like if you and I owed to God the penalty for our sin debt? Could you imagine the grace that is inherent in the blood of Jesus Christ being taken from you? Could you imagine what life would be like on earth if you were responsible for every blood on the cross? Could you, if you were responsible for every word that you uttered? If you were responsible for every thought that you had? If you were responsible for every action that you took? Could you imagine what life would be like if you were responsible for what's going on in your family, what's going on on your job, what's going on in your church, and what's going on in your mind? Could you imagine what life would be like if you were not only responsible for your today, but you were responsible for your yesterday? Yesterday. You were responsible for the time before you met Jesus. You were responsible for the time before you got your mind right. You were responsible for when you were out here living foot loose and fancy free. You were responsible for how you treated people. You were responsible for the way that you spoke to people. You were responsible. Could you imagine what life would be like if the gift of the Holy Spirit was taken away from you because Jesus never died, and if Jesus never goes up, the Holy Ghost never comes back down. Now, could you imagine what would happen if there was no Holy Ghost on the inside of you, if you were left to your own thoughts, if you were left to your own heart? Uh, could you imagine what life would be like uh, if no one ever told you how to go the right way, uh, if no one ever gave you a different way to think, uh, if no one ever gave you a different way to go, uh, if no one ever gave you a different word to say, uh, if no one ever ministered you the truth. Could you imagine what life would be like? Brothers and sisters, this is why we owe Jesus everything. This is why the psalmist says come into his presence with singing. This is why you've been called to honor your father and your mother. This is why the Bible says bless those who curse you and pray for those who despitefully use you. This is why you've been told to give to anyone who asks of you. This is why God said you ought to get on your knees and say Lord thank you please for the very air I breathe. Because if Jesus doesn't die on that cross, the alternative is catastrophic. To help us understand what would happen, I called an astrophysicist colleague of mine from Georgia Tech. And I asked him, describe for me in painstaking detail what would happen if there was no ozone layer. His response was as follows. Damon, if there was no ozone layer, there would be nothing. Because that's what the earth would be. Nothing. In very short order, the radiation from the sun would reach the earth in full measure. It would immediately damage the DNA of every plant, every human, and every animal on the earth. Within one week, we would all become sterile and reproduction on this earth would end. No new plants, no new animals, and no new humans. No new life form of any kind would be created on this planet. All current life within a month would contract some form of cancer and we would die out within the year. And then this big ball floating around the atmosphere called Earth would be nothing. 
As horrible as that sounds, it is equally horrific to think if Jesus was betrayed and not crucified, what would happen? We would immediately lose our protective covering of the blood of Jesus Christ. The grace of God embedded in the substitution theology of Jesus would be replaced by what they had in the Old Testament, which was the judgment of God. And before too long, after you get God's judgment, you get God's wrath. You see, in the Old Testament, by the time they got to Malachi, they had been killing doves, they had been killing rams, and they had been killing bulls. That is all the blood that had to be shed for the sins of humanity. Do you know why God stopped talking to them in Malachi? It's because enough animals had died, and eventually God was going to require human sacrifice. And so to avoid requiring the blood of humans for the sins of humans, God decided to sin Jesus. God's holiness and God's inability to be in the presence of sin would in very short order reduce us to nothing. Life on earth would cease to exist. I know what some of you are thinking, but Reverend Williams, some of us would make it in, right? Reverend Williams, some of us are righteous. I mean, look at the Bible. Enoch never experienced death. God brought him home. Job was considered righteous. God considered him. Surely some of us would make it right. Look at the chronology of the Bible. You see, Job predates Enoch. And after Enoch, humanity was so bad, there was a flood. And that's all by the sixth chapter of Genesis. Think of where we'd be by the time we get to Romans. The Bible says by the time we got to the third chapter of Romans, all had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That tells me none of us would have made it. All of us would eventually have given in to our own flesh-driven desires. Every single one of us would have selfishly made a decision going the way that we wanted to go and doing what we thought we should do. That's the theological significance of the need for Jesus to be crucified. But what about the practical significance? Well, if you keep reading at verse 16 in your Bible, you'll have to pause and look in the NRSV and you'll notice there's no verse 17. In the NRSV, the Bible jumps from the 16th verse to the 18th verse. This is a mysterious mystery of the book. Why is there no 17th verse? The answer is actually tangentially related to my sermon. So if you would like to know why there's no 17th verse, you have to come to Bible study this week. And at the beginning of Bible study at 7 o'clock, I'll explain why there's no 17th verse. But it's an interesting addition to the crucifixion narrative of what's going on in that 17th verse. But if you keep reading to the 18th verse, remember Pilate had just said he was going to release Jesus. Verse 18 says, then they all shouted together, away with this fellow, release Barabbas for us. Barabbas was the man who had been put in prison for the insurrection that had taken place in the city and he was responsible for a murder. Pilate warned he wanted to release Jesus, and he addressed them again. He said, no, I need to release this man. He's done nothing wrong, verse 21. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him, verse 22, a third time. Pilate said to them, what evil has he done? I have found in him no grounds for the sentence of death. I'm going to have him flogged, and I'm going to uh, release him. Verse 23 is the important verse. But they urgently demanded with loud shouts that he should be crucified. So Pilate gave in. Their voices prevailed. And Pilate crucified Jesus. Think about if Jesus was not crucified from a practical perspective. If Pilate had stuck to his guns, all of the military that was in the court at the time would have had to deal with the riot and the civil unrest that would have come from the Jews not getting what they wanted. In the anarchy of violence and other foolishness that would have occurred, there would have been a disruption in not only the collection but also the payment of the taxes going to the emperor. And ultimately, Pilate would have been replaced as someone who couldn't keep the Jews calm. 
In an instant, it is my fate that Pilate calculated his own selfish need. If I, as the Roman governor of Judea, am telling these people I'm going to release this man, and they are so angry with this man that they are going to disagree with me and claim that they want to crucify him, if I don't give the people what they want, there's going to be problems. And if there are problems, that's going to interrupt the payment of taxes. And if that happens, I'm going to get replaced. Practically speaking, Pilate thought about his own needs and his own family and gave in to the Jewish request. And every one of us in here can understand exactly why Pilate did what he did. Because do you realize that the story of the crucifixion wouldn't make sense if Jesus was betrayed but not crucified? Do, do you realize this story wouldn't make sense if Pilate had released Jesus? Think about it. A Roman governor who has absolutely no ties to Jesus puts himself and his family's safety and welfare on the back burner and does the ethical and moral thing to release Jesus. Where they do that? Who, who you know that acts like that? Without Jesus' crucifixion, you and I would read this story and the story wouldn't seem true and accurate to the human condition. Humans are selfish by nature. Humans think about themselves, their needs, and the needs of their family before they think about anybody else. No human that you and I know was going to privilege a stranger named Jesus over their own wife and children. Practically speaking, if Jesus was betrayed but not crucified, you and I wouldn't be Christians today because this book wouldn't make sense and we wouldn't follow the Bible. It would be a fanciful fiction. The cold-hearted reality and practicality of the way things happened is that human selfishness is the grand setup for divine unselfishness. It, it explains how we really are and who we seek to be. You see, brothers and sisters, it takes our own human nastiness and it takes our own human selfishness. It takes our own human greed to be replaced by the divinity of God to see true change in our lives. If you and I weren't as evil as we naturally are, then we wouldn't look as good when we found Jesus in the first place. If you and I weren't as selfish as we naturally are, then we wouldn't look as good when we cleaned up and denied ourselves and took up our cross and followed Jesus. If you and I weren't as dark as we naturally are, then we wouldn't look as good when the light of Jesus Christ shines in our life. The practical reality of why Jesus had to be crucified is because, practically speaking, we are who we are. And for us to get any better, it takes Jesus. With this knowledge, brothers and sisters, you can leave here today and take advantage of the blood of Jesus Christ that has been so graciously and sacrificially given up for you. You can realize in reading the narrative up to this point, I am no better than Judas. I am no better than these chief priests. I am no better than Pilate. But for the goodness and the graciousness of Jesus Christ in my life, where would I be? If Jesus was betrayed but not crucified, Jesus would still be here. But we would not. God bless you, Providence. Amazing grace.